Yeah, we're good. All right. Um, so uh, what I saw in your first episode was a basis. Like everyone that you're bringing in has that foundational layer, which isn't something that's common in entrepreneurs. They don't have something they can relate to. Uh, and now you're taking that community, you're taking our community, and you're making it bigger. So everyone starts there, and that's just a given. So all your audience has that that background. And it may not even be military. They may have decades in like a service industry. It doesn't freaking matter. They have, they have a foundation letter. Um, and then personal brand. If you're looking at our profiles on LinkedIn, we have the same type of setup. It says, this is what I've done, and this is what I'm doing, and this is where I'm going. Not every entrepreneur has that vision. And it's something that's baked into us very early, especially in schools, man. I mean, I went through a lot of schools, and so did you. And in each school, they were like, you aren't crap until we tell you you are. And then after you get through my class, you go to another place where you'll become even better. So that's the journey of entrepreneurs, man. It's like you start in a new area every day. And it's not necessarily something that you're going to get any schools on. But you can find somebody in this network that you created that has that thought and we're maybe able to connect you to somewhere. And that's, that's that personal brand. So I'm using a, a Rob Kiyosaki model too, by the way. I, I put your, your whole first episode into a Rob Kiyosaki model. So the- Where the, did you get that Rob, from? Rob, Rob Kiyosaki. All right, so let me explain money. Money, according to Rob Kiyosaki, is the best description I've ever heard of. And he, he talks about this in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, but he doesn't go into great detail. And Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he talks about his rich dad and his poor dad. And his poor dad follows the advice of everyone else. Go to school, go in debt, you know, get a good job, work forever, and then die in, in debt, right? And then your kids have to pay for you. That's his poor dad. And his rich dad's like, hey, I want to spend time with my kids. I'm going to invest in real estate. I'm going to figure it out, right? That's entrepreneur land. So he yeah. talks about, Rob Kiyosaki talks about being an entrepreneur. And then he says, choice is yours. His next book is a four-page model. It's a four-pace four model. And it goes, how money is made. And it looks like this. At the very lower level, which we already did, is employment. That's you trading your time for money to get something in return. So if you're trading your time for money and you're getting a skill, solid. Okay. Um, for us, we all got different skills, but we all learned a lot about how to teach people, how to communicate, and how to be effective. And have that mindset to where we can get through. And you're not going to tell me no. I mean, you might, but I'm, not, I'm just not going to take that. I'm not. I don't, I, don't, I don't hear that word in any language. It still sounds the same. It's just I mute it. So no is not something we, we, we are, are used to hearing. So from that perspective, that's our employment time. We're done with that. Now, for me and probably you guys, I'm getting e-money for the rest of my life. That doesn't work anymore. That's a pension, man. That's Ford put that in place, right? When he, when he made the difference between management and leadership, because we were paying people like 30 cents. And he's like, well, if we do an assembly line, I could pay them $3 to do something simple. And then I don't need leaders. I just need managers. And I could pay them more too. And then we're going to create this funnel of people who are going to be loyal to us, right? And we're going to give them a pension. And that's where it all started. And now, whenever that comes back, Detroit, prime example, like when Motor City was at its prime, everyone was buying cars. Detroit was awesome. And it's still a great city, but it just isn't like it was, right? Because of the pensions really kicked in. And now you have people in that city like, you know, Slim Shady or whatever he's going by today. I don't know, man. I don't follow that <laughs> stuff too too much. But like he's a good dude because he he brought people back into Detroit, right? And it's the same thing. Um, whenever you're you're doing a pension, you can't afford it long term. So now you know, America's realized that it's easier to worship vets than it is to actually take care of them because, man, we have a recruiting problem for a reason. And it's what's the incentive, man? You know, before I could join and maybe have a pension. And like, we're part of that dying breed now. But if you're still in the military and you're watching this show, you have a pension, you got this e money I'm talking about. So that's the very bottom layer. That's what everyone teaches you. You go to school to learn how to work for somebody, you, le you learn how to work for somebody and get paid more money so you can be in Ford's model. That's cool. Do that. If you're comfortable with that, sick, right? But that's where everyone started. We started there. Um, my friend likes to call it hard scrabble. 
you know, I got all Z's and X's and I'm like, what the hell am I going to do with this? And then, you know, I'm like, oh, the xylophone is a word. I don't know. Uh, you know, and you start making words and you're like, oh, that's a big win. And then win after win after win. So that's, that's important. And then the next thing is business ownership. This is another thing you can go to school to learn. This is what, um, what you, what your, what your first episode was about. Sean talked about this in business school. You go to business school to learn how to be your own boss. And it's still trading time for money because you got to do that too. It's part of the cycle, right? You got to figure out what you're going to do and then you have to set it up. No one's going to set it up for you. You know, you, whatever business you want to be in, whatever your flavor is, whatever your niche, no one's going to set that up. You have to figure out what you want to do, who you want to help, what your specific niche is, and then you have to go there and then you have to set it up. It's just like we were taught to do. You know, here is your mission. Here's your objective. These are the things you need to hit. In, in order, in order for this to be effective. And it doesn't always work like that, right? Mike Tyson says, every plan is great, right? Until, yeah, until you until get, get punched in the mouth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no one has a plan to fight me until they, until they get punched in the face. Yeah, that's the one, man. <laughs> and, and it's the same thing with the business ownership. You get punched in the face a freaking ton. And the people that get through the punches and, and end up fighting it out, they, they become better fighters. They get well known and they're just like a bamboo tree, right? So the bamboo tree, right? I love this one. When you put a bamboo seed in the ground, it takes at least three weeks to germinate. The the prime example everyone uses is the Chinese bamboo. That junk takes five years of water and fertilization. But then in five years, it grows to ninety feet tall in five weeks. That's Impressive business movement. ownership. That's yeah. bit that's entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. You're like, I hope this works. I hope this works. And you're planting seeds. You're like, man, I hope this works. And your voice is cracking. And you're like telling all the people <laughs> that you love, hey, this is going to work. And they're like, I want to believe you, but your voice is weird. You know, and you just keep that bamboo, right? Um, so this is the bamboo part of the journey. You go into that Rob Kiyosaki. Those are the two things that you can learn in school. Two things that they'll teach you that everyone has a, a program for. Um, and they, th that's where society wants you to be. But the government on the other side of it, the black side of it, as I like to call it, um, wants you to be an entrepreneur because 95% of businesses in America are small businesses. And now they want you to be in that cycle, especially veterans. So uh, I've looked at a couple things. Franchising, for example, I looked at School of Rock. There's a lot of veterans in there. It's one of the, the, the top franchises if you have the money to get into. It costs half a mil to start. Um, a bit in a year, and then you'll start being lucrative probably relatively quick because they have a great model and they've put together a process. And I'll talk is about that. Is that, that later. a franchise school or is that a specific franchise? Yeah, it's a franchise school. So they have okay. a program. You go to Chicago, you learn how to, how to do all that stuff. I, I started talking about it, and then for this year with me and my TED Talk and my new book, I'm like, yeah, I don't, I'm not gonna have time, man. And where they want so me to put one it. One of the things we're doing with, with Vetchmere Collective is, is we're teaming up with different organizations. So um, like on the ETA side, I know you haven't touched on it, but like entrepreneurship through acquisition, purchasing businesses. Yeah. So we're going to be partnering up with Clearly Acquired, uh, Samson Jigoris' company to help raise capital, get guys trained up to make sure that they are they understand the, the operating procedures and how to restructure a company after it's been purchased. You know, you're not just going to yeah. go in there and do the same thing necessarily. Um, and then we have Tom Scarda with Franchise Academy. So he's done a similar thing. He, when he was younger, he started, a, uh, well, he opened up a franchise. I think it was like Smoothie King or some, some smoothie thing. Mm -hmm. um, did really well. He's like, this franchise thing is great and easy. I'm just going to open up another one. And then that one tanked. Uh, it was like a, a soup one that nobody wanted. Um, so he's like, so when, when he goes through and, and does these, uh, the Academy stuff, he's like, I can tell you the high side and the low side of, of franchising. Um, and guy. so he, he works with people. Plus he also, uh, I don't remember how many hundreds of, of franchisors he works with, but like he can get discounts, especially for veterans discounts like on it. those, those initial purchases. Um, yeah. and then make sure that you're, you're successful. And then on, on the third channel. So I usually say there's three B's to, to entrepreneurship. You can either build, borrow or buy building. Yeah. It is that third one where you take it from, from scratch. Um, and that's just, hey, I've got a cool idea. I want to make this this into a business. Let's figure it out. And it doesn't have to be something something new or novel. You know, it can be. I want to yeah. be. I want to open up a 10%. plumbing shop. Um, there's a thousand and one plumbers in the area. 
but yeah. I'm going to do it my way. Uh, that's that's still that that build mentality of I'm going to take this idea and make it into something. Just because it's a, a proven business model doesn't mean it's not unique. Yeah, man, I like that. Um, Cody Sanchez, mm-hmm. you know, do you know her? You know her husband? Uh, yeah, he went to buds with me. Chris yeah, did. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's a funny dude. Yeah, he he looks like he's he'd be he'd be good to have a couple of drinks with uh, if I'm if I'm out there. But yeah, but, um, Cody uh, Sanchez, she's putting out a lot of that stuff, man, and mm-hmm. it's all gold. Yeah, she's all in that ETA space. I love that. Um, and and her uh, her spots are freaking on point. I posted one yesterday because it matched my TED talk. I'm like, see, even Cody Sanchez. <laughs> Just copy like, my oh. stuff. I did that first. <laughs> yeah, I, it's me. There's a copyright on that. No, she uh, yeah. she changed it. Um, but it's the same thing, man. Like success breeds success, and it's the same model. It's just rephrased. And if you're paying attention, you can pick it all up, man. Mm-hmm. It's just like you know, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. You know what I mean? It's the same concept. If That's you look one of the at things it, we were thinking about for the name of yeah, the podcast, yeah, we're like slow podcast smooth. Name. We were really? tossing out all kinds of ideas. Yeah. We had like, we had some some serious ones like uh, venture veterans and elite ventures. We're like, nah, uh, man, my favorite one was. Uh, what was it? Commando. What was it? C- Commando, Commando conversations. Yeah. Commando <laughs> conversations. You got to show up in your underwear. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I'm going Everybody's Rambo gonna stand today. up at one point. <laughs> We're all wearing really silky pants. Going Commando. Having conversations. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, uh, that would lady. fit the, the, uh, we could, the veteran You mold. know, we could have started a calendar off of that as well. Everybody mm. could have been part of like, I mean, Atlas would be Mr. January. Yeah. Yeah, Bro, I'll send good. some pictures, man. I got some from back in the day when I was when I was doing that stuff. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> now I'm gonna have to jump on Google and be like Atlas. Actually, so a quick question on yeah, your man. your LinkedIn, you have Atlas parentheses yeah. Joshua. Is Atlas a call yeah. sign or is that just a nickname you go by? Yeah, man. So my, uh, I talked about this in my TED talk, and this goes right into I'm gonna keep on this this whole thing, personal branding, man. So your uh, your business ownership, the second thing that that Kai, Kaiosaki talks about is total business ownership for yourself and working at it. Um, one of the things we all do and what you, what you, what we're doing in this community is that personal brand. And this is part of my personal brand. So, um, my mom named me Joshua Michael because, uh, I don't know if you can't, you can't probably see it, but like back here, it got a Mac V SOG. My, mm-hmm. my grandpa was a green beret and my, my dad was in the special, op- my, my dad was in the special forces community. So my mom named me Joshua Michael. And she told me throughout my childhood, she's like, that means leader of warriors. So when you go in the army and you get a green beret or a ranger tab, you can carry on the family legacy. And then, uh, you know, the steady stream of recruiters come through my house and you know, my, my dad's like going to the Air Force. I'm like, well, you know, green berets in the Air Force. And he's like, he's like, no, nah, you, you'll be good. Just go in there. That, just go in. Uh, you, you'll be next to the top brass. So I put that in my, my TED talk. And so I really, I made my mom mad, right? And uh, oh, your dad, who was actually in the army, was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, 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 trust me. He knows He's like, like, <laughs> yeah, so Don't um, listen to your mom, yeah, yeah. So, like, throughout my, my whole Air Force career, I'm a ground guy, you know. I didn't, I, I mean, I, I flew in planes, but I didn't fly planes, you know. I, I was always like assigned to the tactical units, the the Rangers of the, uh, of the Air Force, you know. And then we deployed with the Rangers and, uh, and I started doing special operations missions from the Air Force as the, as the Air Force guy. And, uh, we started really down that path as a family. And then, you know, I was in Afghanistan that they offered me a job, uh, to be a director out there. I was the, the CJ six for, um, NSOC Alpha, Sajidif Alpha. And I was like, there's not, there's not a better job, man. And we were doing battlefield rotations back and forth. And when I got to the team, um, I, I started assessing everybody like you always do, man. You're like, what are you, what are you good at? You know? And we started coming up with these grandiose plans and throughout my enlisted career, I found this pattern because I, he was right. I changed the way the promotion system worked in the air force because I was an entrepreneur back then, you know, I'm like, this doesn't make sense. And they're like, well, tell somebody. And I'm like, well, I'm telling you. And they're like, tell the air force. And I'm like, okay. And the air force is like, that's a great idea. And the idea was to alphabetize the promotion list because it came out in numbers in the 90s. I'm like, how does pe- how do people find their names? I'm like, why don't they just alph- alphabetize this? And they're like, that's a great idea. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> seriously. And they're like, seriously, put that in. So um, yeah, I got I got a, a freaking 
monetary award and a medal out of that. But uh, <laughs> then they promoted me to sergeant. This is why your dad told you to join the Air Force. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then no, they promoted me to like, sergeant. Shut up. And they put yeah. me in. Um, they put me in the CAG, but not the CAG. You know, they call it the Commander's Action Group for the four star. And so I was really close to this decision pattern, and I realized all the generals that were coming in and making decisions were focused on three things that I talk about that in my TED talk. So for entrepreneurs, um, the decision model isn't five plus who. It's not who, what, where, when, why, and and how. It's only three things. People only think about three things, and the generals really emphasize this. But it's not stated in any general school or polishing school. But this is how real life works. When faced with a problem, people ask these three questions in this order. If it's money that they're worried about, they say, how much is it going to cost? And if it's time and how fast they need it to get done, they say, when can it get done? And the third thing that they think about is who can do it. So they ask in that order because they've been conditioned to do that. And that's what they'll, they'll teach you at school, any place you go to school. But entrepreneurs and general officers and winning elite leaders look at it opposite way. Like when you were assessing somebody to come on your team, did you look at how much that cost or, or when they were going to show up? Mm-hmm. Hell no, you didn't. Like anybody that I brought onto my team, they got an interview. There was a panel of us. I sat down and talked to them and we figured out who they were, if they'd fit on the team, if they were going to be a good fit. And that's what I do as an entrepreneur. I look at the, the person that's coming on my team. I still do the same stupid stuff, right? But in Afghanistan, I was doing that. At, at, at length, everybody that came on the team, what are they passionate about? And I was fueling their passions instead of the job that they were hired to do. So we're out there talking to Kateas, we're, we're talking to Rangers, we're out there talking to the seventh group, we're talking to um, mostly, it was mostly West Coast SEAL teams that came out. So um, the fun there's ones. a lot of the SEALs that came in and out. And I was like, hey, and they all said the same thing, you know? Um, but this is where this is where Atlas came from. Um, during that time, we were doing battlefield rotations, civil war going on, COVID, I just wear stupid masks. Well, we were in bad man land a lot. A lot of things were happening. Um, my wife at the time was like, hey, I don't want to be married. I'm like, that's awesome. That's, that's good. And then we had like five houses because I started my entrepreneurship you know, like early. I had houses everywhere. No one was paying rent because it was COVID. And uh, <laughs> my shoulder was jacked because, you know, I'm you're jumping in and out of helicopters, man, with gear on. People don't realize, man, when you get older, you can't do what you did when you were younger. So, like, they, they always made fun of me because my backpack was was making, like, TikTok noises or Tic Tacs, you know? And it's like, that's the joint medicine that old people have to carry, bro. Like, I can't yeah, just run around nice little, like you. You have that strip with Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so then we were going out there, and uh, and so CG calls me in, and Commanding General calls me in in the office right before I left, and he's like, hey, man, you crushed it. I'm like, Hey, cool, man. Um, now my guy's crushed it. Thanks, though. You know, he's like, I agree. Go tell him because you know, the special operations world is different than everyone else. Like these guys really see people. So, um, CG and the DCG at the time, I had a a a, a good CG, uh, General Evans. He was phenomenal, and we would talk ops, and that was just the first time he'd bring all the directors together to talk ops and. Most of the times, you know, it was like two or three of us that were talking. Anyways, no matter. Great guy. And then the DCG was an Air Force guy. You know, most people don't realize the Air Force has special operations because they don't tell anybody. But John Chapman's video being released now. That like, thing's yep. remarkable. Yeah, I mean, but now people are realizing the Air Force has special operations. And I'm like, I was working Secrets for out, a DCG. Man. Yeah, it was just like, he was, he was one of those, you know, special, special teams guys. And I'm, I'm like, love this guy. Also a people person. So um, when I told the team, I was like, hey, the CG told you, uh, told me that, that you crushed it. They're like, cool, come in for a call, call sign ceremony. And this is like, this is a special event, man, because this is a sacred event in the Air Force and in the military. If you get a call sign, you know, that's that's like you're coming into my family. I'm going to give you a warrior name and you're going to be called by that, by all the people who, who were in this stuff with you, you know, because people don't get like. Even even if you're in the military, you're not going to war. Half half of the people that I talk to, they're like, yeah, I ain't never been over there. You know, I, I wanted to. No, you didn't, man. <laughs> like, and then when you're in there, if you're over in a war zone, that don't mean nothing to you. You're just like going to the desk. But like when you go experience something with people and you're in combat or if you ever have 
bullets fly by you, explosions pop off, and, and there's a brotherhood or a sisterhood sometimes. It's different. And um, that was the first time that I actually embraced the call sign because I used to laugh at those guys. But what was this Viper? Was it what's your cool cool name, dude? And uh, they were like, they were like, hey. So they start with stories. They say, hey, you figured out who we were. And then um, back to Sean again. You know, they said you told us who you were and who you weren't, and you didn't do anything that you're bad at. You found people that that that, that were good at the things that you sucked at and that we sucked at. And we moved a lot faster. And, you know, all this time when we were meeting with the people who needed us, you know, because we're going, we're the first teams to go out there and talk to everybody and be like, hey, what do you need? And like, the teams are like, this is fantastic. I'll tell you exactly what I need. I'm like, please do. We won't be shy. Right. Yeah. So I got all the stuff and then we started giving them what they needed, man. And, you know, I can't go into it because a lot of it's classified. But like whenever you ask the person who's doing the job what they need and they say, I need a hammer for this nail. And then you give them a hammer, stuff starts to get built, right? <laughs> that's, that's what happens. Um, whenever you can make a hammer faster or you can make it more powerful or you can take the nail uh, and, and just you know, make it just easier to hit, then uh, that's what I got to do, man. And I, and I love that job. There's no job I could have got better than that. So I was like, I'm going to retire. But anyways, they called me in. They said, you, you held all this stuff on, on your back, and you were carrying it. Um, and we went through a really tough time in history because Trump was like, we're leaving. And we started getting everything out because we knew he was serious. And, uh, yeah, uh, they said, we, we have to call you Atlas. So uh, I was, they were like, we've got to call you Atlas. And I was like, guys, I'd never said this before, but I'm actually going to use that. So. After my divorce was final, anyone who knows me, uh, anyone who stayed in my life, anyone who's now in my entrepreneur journey, these uh, entrepreneurial uh, tasks, everyone who knows me now, anyone who I let in my life calls me Atlas because I'm no longer able to be a leader of warriors like my mom wanted me to be. But she, she would have been proud if she was still alive, man. I think she would call me Atlas too. Um, but yeah, I mean, I worked with the Green Berets, but I also got to work with the SEALs. And also the Air Force Special Operators in Marsoc. I had a phenomenal Marine deputy who was just on it, right? And we still talk today. And uh, he's not in Marsoc anymore, but just a great dude. And, and it's you can't ask for any better experience than being at the tip of the spear with the most elite people there with you. Um, so I found a lot of benefit out of that. And then I took that, and that's what's right in my next book. And that's what was my TED Talk was about. Was it's all about who, man. Yeah, tell us, tell us about the TED Talk you have going on. I know you sent me the, the <laughs> video. It starts with who, even yeah. though you hate Simon Sinek. Uh, you know what? I want to touch on that. It's probably a strong word. Dis, <laughs> yeah. Dislike Simon Sinek. Um, yeah, I don't agree with him. Um, and I'm not, I, I can't. I got to be careful because if I do blow up, this is going to come out, right? So. <laughs> I mean, you, you're you're allowed to have an opinion about uh, I, I have another an opinion, person that that has. But I can't defame him, and my opinion defames him. Uh, so uh, I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll scratch the surface. But I was told by a couple professional athlete coaches I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't say this stuff, and that's always fun discussions, right? Because these guys have been in the public light, and they're like, "Yeah, we're gonna get it." So <laughs> you're gonna get Simon it. Sinek. Simon Sinek's um, talk start with why. Uh, reverses the age-old conversation of who, what, where, when, and why, right? And he uses mm-hmm. an example that makes sense, but really it's a marketing strategy. And the marketing strategy looks like this. Don't sell the drill, sell the hole. That's very common. It's a big marketing strategy. And he took that and he applied it to what they're calling leadership. But when Simon Sinek delivered that talk, I don't think it was a leadership talk. I think it was a marketing talk because he was a marketing major. He's, uh, he failed out of uh, law school, if you, if you know his history. And then he went on the TED stage, and his TED stage failed too. So uh, TED stages don't fail too often. So I'd imagine what drove people to that conversation was to watch what happens when a TEDx talk fails. And he took what a, do you mean by a failed? whiteboard. Like, like it actually like collapsed? Yeah. If you watch mine, I have a giant screen behind me. There's a lot of technology involved in it. They have like a screen out there if you want to read from it. But the screen in his isn't there that did not, did not, didn't work. So they brought out a chop block and he's writing on the board. And this is not something that you see in TED Talks. 
And I'm not defaming Ted either. This is just what happened. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people were trying to figure out what happens when your technology fails. And they went and saw his talk and they were like, ah, oh, he's a good communicator. Because he's phenomenal. He's a great at communicating. Speaker. Yeah, he's great orator. So I mean, great speaker. But he's sharing a theory that's a marketing theory and he's trying to apply it to leadership. This is why it pisses me off. Because every time I'm trying to teach my leaders how to lead, my, my leaders of leaders at elite levels, they're like, well, it depends on what your why is. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> why are you here if you don't know why you're here? Like, why did you want to be a part of the organization if you didn't know what we do? Why are you asking me why? That's what kids do. Like, you're not a kid. So it drove me crazy. My whole career I had to deal with this. And I, you know, I just went with a bunch. It's kind of know where it came from. Like every war college I went to. Even at the Naval War College, I watched his stupid talk. And they're like, you should watch that later. I'm like, how about no? And that, that, was, not, that was not famous. But then what I noticed Simon do, another thing that makes me mad, is he'll take somebody else's story and he'll, and it's always a military story. Dude's not in the military. So he's talking about stuff he doesn't know. And then just, there's a lot of things there. Like, there's a lot of things. It's, don't ask a ranger about Simon Sinek. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how Green Berets are. I never went to Simon Sinek with Green Berets. I always talk business with them because they're very much like, I got to get back to training these guys. So we're gonna, I'm going to tell you what I need, and then I got to get back. Um, the SEALs were like, I don't, I don't care, man. What do, you, what do you got for this? <laughs> but like the Rangers don't, don't want. We have to get like back to the beach. Yeah. What do you think, Greg? I, I I haven't heard any theories on him. I'm not a huge Simon Sinek fan. I've like talked about it in a couple of posts. I am of the opinion that uh, he's got the book Leaders Don't Eat Last. And That's I, stupid. Yeah, I just, I just I disagree with it. And a uh, stupid idea. Yeah, I mean, come on. I mean, I, I think I, I, I hate the airbag analogy, but like, I mean... At some yeah. point, if you're not if you're not operating at 100, percent then you can't give your team the best you have. Um, and that's right. Uh, you especially take care on an of ODA, you first. it starts 100%. here, man. Yeah. Like if you're not a whole up team member, oh man. So like I got crushed when I started doing these podcasts. People were hitting me up in my community, in my Air Force community, and you're like, you're not being a quiet professional. I'm like, let me tell you what a quiet professional is. Quiet professional. I am a quiet professional. Because I went to the ranger docks and they shot me in the shoulder so that I could go on mission the next day. Because I knew if I wasn't on the team, my team would be down. But I didn't tell my team I was hurt. I just did the freaking mission. And I, and I got a pictures. I'm all, I got everything on, man. I got my rifle. I got my, my secondary. I got a whole kit. And I'm not going to let anything happen when we go into some area. And I'm not going to give you somebody that they don't know to go on mission. You know, it, it's important. It's important to be whole. That's a quiet professional. You know, I'm going to do my job. I don't care how broke I am. Look at NFL. Look at, look at any professional athlete. They'll tell you they don't want to be let down. They don't, they don't want to be off mm -hmm. the team whenever it matters. I'm no different. That's quiet professional. Telling people that you're doing amazing work is, is something you need to do. And well, if you're not so, doing it. This is a conversation it, I have with people all the time, especially um, – team guys and soft guys as they're getting out they're like i'm, I'm yeah. not supposed to talk about that i'm like who you said that to. It, it, i mean it just <laughs> goes back to like while you're in the military maybe yeah sure don't go to the bars announcing that you're you're a seal that's that's a lot of books right there <laughs> oh this is just the navy <laughs> stack <laughs> we'll, we'll add a couple more to that but yeah seriously. Like, you, you have to learn to to explain what you did otherwise um, something as simple as Someone's going to go on LinkedIn and be like, hey, what's this like 10 year gap you have on yeah. your thing that just says Navy? Like, it just, yeah. you sound very coy and elusive if people have to do the 18 yeah. questions to get. My, my wife does it all the time because she's from New York, which is from Staten Island. And so people <laughs> ask her the question, where are you from? Oh, New York. Oh, wh where about the city? Yeah. Oh, wh you know, one of the suburbs. It mm -hmm. takes her like six levels of questions before she's finally like, I'm from Staten Island. All right. Don't hold it against me. Um, <laughs> and, and so like, I, I feel like, you know, SEALs and, and other soft guys do something similar. They're like, yeah, I was, I was in the Navy. I, I shoot guns. I, I go to overseas. Yeah. And it's like all these yeah. levels of I questions to find the get. Yeah. I was in the Air Force. Get, People like, I, I was at a SEAL. Fly? <laughs> <laughs> also true. Um, and so I think it's really important for guys to, to learn how to talk about this. You don't have to talk yeah. about it in a way that's like, I'm the coolest guy ever. Uh, nope. You know, look at me no. how great i am it's just this is something i did 
it is now a credibility build. There's no different it than is. saying you worked at Boston Consulting Group or you went to Harvard. It is, it is a credibility marker of you are a hardworking, dependable, loyal, trustworthy yeah. person that yeah. can get things done. Well, not even that. It's it's more than that, man. Because how many people are, are in the military that aren't trying to be the best military member that they can be? You know, mm -hmm. uh, when you start off in the SEAL track, I, I'm not sure how you came in, but um, when you Dude, start the off the SEAL I'm track. Weird. Yeah, you came out of the Marines. <laughs> yeah, he's a crazy So, here. I mean, <laughs> I'm but, a weird one. But that's okay. I mean, I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, right? I enjoyed so, it. I had a great time. Yeah, but the track to get there is crazy. So, um, you know, like I said, like the guys out of my community, there's like 20 of us, maybe. Maybe 21. I don't know. We keep getting out. And the Air Force isn't replenishing us. They're like, hey, we don't need any more ground pounding guys that know how to use radios. Thank you. I'm like, okay. Um, but Good luck. Whenever, yeah, it's you're going to. Uh, and you're not going to be able to mass produce us either because it takes a long time, man. It, it took me like two years of school to go through, um, you know, SEER and uh, advanced shooting and tactics and to understand how to fold into a team if I needed to. And I, I luckily never had to do that. <laughs> but I was on a lot of teams that um, that needed me. And if I didn't go through all that training, then I don't know where I'd be right now. Sometimes, you know, when things get crazy, people do things that they don't realize they're going to do and that's all part of the situation and it folds back into who you are you're absolutely right like telling people that i was part of a, a community that is special and elite tells them something about me and for me to hold that and then play the 20 questions for them to get out it makes them feel like i i don't belong i don't feel like i belong in that community and bro also true yeah I worked my ass off to get in that community. And then every day I had to prove myself to be uh, at that level to where I could communicate and be effective in that community. And that's just not something that's given to you, man. You don't get to just be on a team. They're not like uh, this guy. You know, it takes a lot to get into these communities. Uh, so mm -hmm. whenever I tell somebody I was part of the special operations community and I worked with special forces and I worked with SEALs, that tells them something about me. That tells them, that I, I can communicate at a high level and that I think differently of myself and I hold myself to a higher standard than someone else who may not be at that level. So mm -hmm. you, bro, I mean, I'm, I don't know, man, <laughs> just, I have no idea what, what's going on with that. But Greg, I mean, well, your community is usually the one that bashes people. Uh, they're like, Hey, be quiet. Uh, what do you think about this, man? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing for, because you're not telling war, it's not like you're telling war stories. You're you're selling the tools and the mindset that that made you successful. Um, so yeah. be it you know communicating or or leadership skills and leadership lessons. I think that that's the that's the important thing at the end of the day is that you're able to communicate. You know what what you learned, not to, not not exactly about what what you did, um, and. And that's, I think, the distinction that you need to to really make is like we're not nobody's asking you to tell a war story. You're just you yeah. just got to be mm -hmm. able to communicate um, what you learned. Yeah, I stayed away from all that. Um, so Jocko Willink's um, TED Talk got flagged because he talked about his experience at war, and so I have I have those I have those I just don't I don't share them. Um, so I stayed away from that specifically at my TED Talk, and I talked about. You know, my mom started me off on this journey, and then I thought it was the five W's plus how. It took me two years to make a good decision, right? And then two months later, my four-star general made a great decision to choose me to go to college. And then I was like, how did that work? Because email was new, and I was printing out all of his emails and putting them in the binders. I was able to see every decision he was making, and I got the backwards track, like who he talked to and like Wait, what he you did. You had to literally print out all of his emails and put them in Not all the time. But yeah, but like <laughs> I love the this military like, so much. We we have no, this cool the, thing that stores all this information. But I still want you to print them out and put them into a binder. Probably label it, store it on a shelf. Uh, no, man, you gotta a tracker. Like, this is late '90s. <laughs> I, I'm old, bro. Uh, so this was late or uh, mid '90s, and we had just gotten email like in '91 into the world, so it was relatively new. Like we still had message centers where they'd be like, "Hey, can you go get?" this classified message for the general. And I'm like, where is it? And you're like three buildings down, you know, <laughs> so you go pick up the message and bring it. But like all the under uh, unclassified decisions, um, they'd come through his email and then he'd be gone, man. Like 
generals back then used to do the, the old patent, right? So patent, ground truth. Here's, here's one for entrepreneurs. You need to know this because it's a great story and it relates. If you want to know what's going on, you go down to the people who are doing the work. Patton perfected this whenever he was doing war um, at uh, massive levels. He would get updates that went through the, the ranks, right? One star, two star, three star to Patton. And then he'd be like, that's not right. That can't be right. And he'd get in a Jeep and he would drive down to the battleground to get what he called ground truth. So ground truth is a military term that came from, I'm going to ask the person who needs the decision to be made what they need so that I can make the best decision. And I employed that all the time. Every job that I did, I always asked the person who was doing it. And in corporations, this is called consulting. So you hire a consultant and the consultant comes in and talks to the people who are doing the job and they say, hey man, what do you need? And they're like, I'm glad you asked, man. I got this list over here. Um, you got a pen? And then they tell you and then you go, okay, thank you, man. And then you bring that up to their leadership and you go, hey, uh, this is what you need. And they're like, this is amazing. How did you get all this so fast? And you're like, I asked the question. Ground truth, man. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, you know where Patton got it from? Napoleon. You know where Napoleon got it from? Alexander the Great. You know where we were all? Where Alexander the Great stopped in Afghanistan. So, like, you know, history is just a full cycle. If, you, if you're a student of history, you can be successful because you can avoid a lot of the pitfalls. But, but back into um, Kaisaki's model, I told you the two ways that, that everyone teaches you how to do it. Now, you guys are on the flip side of this. And if you do life right, you can transition from um, employment money and business ownership into investment and total business ownership. And this is how you do it. Exactly how you do it, man. All your, your newsletters that are going out, your email list, and your sharing is making a community. And the community itself becomes this other side, this black side, this black side of where we are used to being. I'm used to being in the gray, man. There ain't no rules over here. The rules mm -hmm. that you have are the ones that you make. And whatever it is, better be right, better be legal, better be moral right? Because you're going to be held accountable to all this. It's business ownership. So how do you get there? Investments. And for investments, that's investing in yourself first. You have to be the leader that everyone wants to follow. And if you're not, people are not going to follow you. You have to be worthy of leadership. And I learned this lesson in JSOC, man, because like I come into a whole bunch of alpha type personalities. I'm like, hey, man, you got time? And they're like, and I got like five minutes. I'm like, you got five minutes? You got sit down. You know, <laughs> it's like, you got five. Let me tell you, like, where I think you should be. And they're like, okay, are we done? And I'm like, are we done? Are we done? <laughs> it's like a comedy routine, you know? Um, and then I'm like, why are they treating me like this? I'm like, they don't know me. And so I had to figure out how to get myself into that uh, familiar zone where they can actually communicate with me. And that's alpha, man. That's just, that's oh, where dude. we are. Like we, we're very distrustful of outsiders. Like, yes, I don't know you. Yeah, I don't recognize uh, yeah. you. Absolutely. And then um, when I was when I was at the when I was at the compound, we had hired people from outside the community to come in as experts, and people immediately trusted them because they were hired by you know the top brass. And so we had these people who didn't understand the community influencing the community, and then I had to promote that somehow. And so that was a weird balancing act. And, um, I learned a little bit about entrepreneurship through that experience too, but like, dude, it starts with you investment. So investment number one, where's your time going? You know, so some things you need to start looking at from time is how are you spending your, your downtime? There's a, there's a couple things. If you like movies, you should be watching. Um, so four, there's four of them specifically. Um, that I get a lot of benefit out of. Un Undercover Billionaire. If you can get on the History Channel and watch Undercover Billionaire, you're going to pull out tips and tricks from these billionaires who are self-made. Mm -hmm. And that's where you are. You came from a different background. So you already have the foundation of Futures Bright. If you watch Undercover Billionaire, you're going to find things that they do. And what you're going to see on this show consistently is how people are giving up what they consider to be a comfortable life to have a better one. So 
you're going to see that in Undercover Billionaire. Everyone starts at nothing. They live in their truck, and then they start cleaning the houses sometimes. You know, they're doing the things that they need to do to pay people to help them out. And that's all part of the journey, right? No one's going to teach you that. But you can learn it through Undercover Billionaire. Um, money matters. Uh, there's um, Rich Brother, Poor Brother. Uh, those, those are ones that I would watch. If you watch two of those. I haven't seen either of those. You, if yeah, you, I, you know what? Let me just, I'll put the list and I'll, I'll put it on here for the show notes. Are these, are these on like streaming platforms that you know? Yeah. Of? Yeah. You can absolutely get okay. these. Um, so, and my money and me is the other one. There's, that's the four, four ones you should watch. If you watch those things, you're going to get a sense of, um, of finances. Um, and then the ABCs, right? Everyone talks about it. Accountant, accountants, uh, bankers and uh, councils. So your lawyers. So your ABCs of I like of, that of ABCs. business. Yeah, I'm always I like, yeah, you, that you, you need a yeah, CPA awesome. and a lawyer, but ABC yeah. makes it much easier to remember. Yeah, ABCs. Yeah. yeah. So um, I got that from one of my friends that was uh, in my publishing group, uh, Wall Street Journal bestseller. His book's getting published. Uh, I'll also give you the name of that. It's it's how small business loans work. Um, phenomenal guy, Ambrose uh, Blackwell is his name, and um, it's like the guide to small business loans or something like that. But um, he's great. He came up with that, the ABC model. Uh, but if you're in that, you're good. Um, but then, you know, if you st stem off into that, your investment can then become, after you figure this model out, like accountants, for example, they're going to teach you what to, what to buy and what not to buy. Um, they're going to tell you where, where to, uh, to stay away from what the vectors are, to stay away from things. Um, so if uh, you're talking to your counsels, they're going to keep you out of jail. But here's here's one that I got out of an elite group that I was part of. Uh, they're working from uh, one to a hundred million dollars as a community, and they brought in an accountant. They call her the tax goddess, and she's like, "Do you have a dog at home? I don't know if you can hear the dogs barking in, in, in the back." I just heard your dogs. Don't worry. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> and, if and your a dogs, one, so you're good. If your dogs are over knee height, they're considered security. You could write them off as a business expense. I was like, I'd never heard huh. that before. So like being in these communities is an investment. And I never would have got that little tidbit mm -hmm. if I wasn't investing in myself, like going in these communities to see where I'm at. And like well, my business valuations right now are- if it's not going to be a write-off. Yes. And it can be. <laughs> there you go. You know? <laughs> um, and then like everyone talks about you know, hire your kids. Like your, your kid could be a model. Like Kevin, your, your, your kid could be a model. Mm -hmm. And uh, you pay them with an IRA first. I think it's 6K. And so you start their IRA journey. And then after that, it's tax deductible. But no one tells you about the IRA part, right? It's like, you, you should hire your kid to be part of your, your business. Cool. How does that work? No one tells you. So unless you're investing in yourself, which is finding the right people to be around, you're never going to get there, man. So mm -hmm. it starts with you. Investment starts with you. And then your team. You know, you have to invest in your team, just like we got invested into. If you're not invested in your team, they know, and they'll go somewhere else. So I was at the VA yesterday. You guys ever Fun. go to the VA hospital? Yeah, we have oh, a yeah. good one here in San Diego, at least. We, my, we had a yeah, good mine's one in Colorado good Springs, too. too. Do you? I, yeah, yeah, Colorado Springs one is great. I'm in the yeah, Netherlands yeah. now, but Colorado Springs is yeah. awesome. It was good. We're, we're, I want to I know about that, uh, like how you do healthcare. But I was in the VA yesterday getting my blood work done, and the nurse comes in, and I'm like, hey, watch my TED Talk, because I'm telling everybody now. Okay, watch me. She's like, "What is it?" You know, I'm like, "Selfless well, promotion." Yeah, yeah. It's just like I'm, just I'm all about Google it. I get it. Atlas TEDx. There it is. And then she's so she's taking blood out of me. I'm like, "How do you like this job?" And she said something that was profound. I was like, I'm, "I'm sharing this now." She goes, "I used to work at a bigger hospital here, and they didn't really care about people at all, but I got paid well, and I didn't like it. I, I got I got a lot more money working for them, but I had to deal with." like really bad leaders. And I'm like, okay, how long did you do that? She's like, Thank thankfully I got out in like a year. I took a pay cut, but I started working at another hospital that was rather large and they took care of me really well. So I, I wasn't getting the pay at all, but like I felt better about work. I, I liked going to work. It was a good environment. And I was like, yeah, I'm a big proponent of people. So like, I, even if I take a pay cut, if I can be around the right people, she's like, yeah, but here, Everyone's trying to get here. And I'm like, ooh, tell me more. I've heard so it's that's tough not... to get into the VA. Like, it is yes. a long process. She, that's what she said. She said, 
here you get good pay and they treat you really well. It's like the best of both worlds. And I'm like, and you probably enjoy I, what you're doing. You like to get, yeah, you get to work does. with veterans. Yeah, because we're, I mean, I'm hilarious. I don't know about you guys, but like, I'm funny. So if she's got to deal with me, she just had a good day. <laughs> no, but yeah. So like, I'm thinking about that. And I'm like, man, you know, entrepreneurs, like you get this opportunity to build that environment. And you can be toxic and you can be about the money, but it ain't going to work for long. And you can do that and sell the business to someone who's going to be good to the people. But yeah, yourself and then your team, right? And then the thing that people, everyone has a hard time with, everyone has the worst time with this, is letting other people claim your wins, man. Because there's a lot of good quotes on this, right? Like, if you, uh, if you don't pay attention to who's getting the credit, you can go really, really fast. You know, that's a, that's a former president. I don't remember which one, but yeah, it's amazing what can, it's Roosevelt. It's amazing what can happen when you, when you don't care who gets the credit, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, if you take that mantra, cause really that's kind of where we lived. Like, I didn't care as long as my objective got met and my target got hit. I don't, I didn't care like who did it <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, no one's writing books on the stuff that I'm doing. You know what I mean? They're writing books. If, if I, if I can't do the, the job, there's lots of books on that, um, which there's no books written while I was in charge. Just want I wanted to make that note. Because we spent a lot of time making sure there was no, but that was one of my policies. I was like, no books will be written while I'm here. And they're like, what does that mean? I'm like, look at all the books that get written. When we fail, they write books and do movies and people die. I don't want, I don't want good guys to die. So let's not. And uh, worked out well. But, um, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. But yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's where that came from, man. That you got you to gotta invest in those three things as an entrepreneur uh, to, to do that. So that's your investment portion. And those are the focus areas. Uh, and that's my TED Talk. That's, hey, this is how you make decisions. And this is where you invest everything, your time, your money. And it's all people-based. You know, put the right people in your life. You're going to win. And where are, you, where are you investing in yourself now? Like, what do you see the future of Atlas Altman, yeah, media man. conglomeration, or whatever it is you're trying to build? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm building uh, authority in my space. So... Uh, if you see my LinkedIn profile, I have a, a, a leadership top voice on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So I have authority from that. Um, I have a best-selling book. Um, this one here, self-promotion. Put it on uh, Atlas Altman rule of three. Yeah. For anybody rule that of three. doesn't have video yeah. going. Yeah. So that one, um, that one is, uh, number one in 12 categories, uh, business and leadership, uh, memoirs, biographies. Um, and, and it's basically best practices from my time being around elite people and telling how elite leaders made decisions because I got to be there uh, for the president of the United States, for a lot of four stars, a lot of three stars. And Ted actually checked me on that. Ted was like, Hey, we don't believe you lived the life that you lived. So I had to send him pictures of uh, me in the oval, uh, me on air force one, like my last pit, my last flight on air force one, the boss called me in and I was like, Oh, what's going on? I thought we were getting ready to do something. <laughs> he's like, I just wanted to say, you know, uh, I heard you're leaving. And I'm like, I am. And he's like, I just wanted to give you one of these coins. And I was like, I definitely take that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Naval War College. He's like, oh, that'd be fun. Uh, well, have a good day. And, you know, I'll, I'll never forget that moment. And in fact, I sent him a message. I sent President Obama a message like, hey, man, I remember talking to you on the golf course in my last flight on Air Force One. It was a cherished moments. I love that stuff. Um, but, you know, I, yeah, I talk about some of that stuff in my book where I got did to he watch respond? him. Uh, yeah, no. that was my question. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. we did not. <laughs> no. hey, he, he read it though. He read it. And, no, I, uh, I definitely got the sure. read, read receipt. Yeah. No, yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I, I, I'll probably head up one of his. I'm, I want to use some of the pictures, like that picture that that I just told you about. I st he, I know he's a public figure, but I, st I told him, I said, I still respect your privacy. I'm not going to just push this out without your approval because I have a lot of people. That are like, hey, I want to see that. I'm like, I'll show it to you, but like, you can't do anything with it. And they're like, why? I'm like, it needs a White House release. You need to get his approval, um, or you know, I can get like, I can get brought in on something. I don't know. It's just I just respect his privacy. So, um, anyways, uh, investing in myself. How am I investing in myself? That's where we started, right? Um, I'm writing another book, uh, and everyone should be doing this. If you're really serious about 
SEO, search engine optimization. You need to do a podcast. You need to do as many podcasts as you can. And the way you do that is by reaching out to shows that are in your niche where you can help and provide something that you learn. If you can do that, if you can show yourself as a subject matter expert, like the badge, like the book, like the TED Talk, then when people search you, they're going to either hire you or think about hiring you to help them because you've already given them something. And let me tell you what $100,000 provides me. I've done $100,000 worth of stage um, investments in myself. Uh, and that's learning from the best speaking coaches in the world. And they say this, give your best nugget up front. So have many nuggets that you can give away. Alex Hermosi is the prime example of doing this. He's just going to give, 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 give. And then he's going to ask. He's going to give, 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 give. And then he's going to ask. He's not, he's not taking anything and he's not selling anything. It's cool. Give, 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 give. And then you're like, if you want to buy my book, you know, here it is. You know, I ask you to look at it. And then bestseller on launch day, right? It was number like three on Amazon. So it's an investment. Doesn't he give them away for free as well? He now? does. Well, I, think they're all, are, they're all free. I took his model, man. My, my book's 99 cents on Amazon. And I've been on the bestseller list for like four months. Because who doesn't have 99 cents? <laughs> You want to check out my book? It's 99 I mean, cents if you can't spend, you know, the money to buy the, the hardcover. So um, Cam, that's how it's, it's tough to put a price on saying you're your bestseller, bestselling author. That's um, it. When you're, when you're promoting yourself, especially if you're looking to do a speaking tour or anything like that. Well, so everyone should be looking to do a speaking tour. If you're an entrepreneur, you need to tell people how you help people. If you're not telling people how you help them, they're not going to find you, man. You can be the best operator in the world. But if you're not on that team, nobody, nobody knows you. Nobody, nobody knows who you are. So you, you try really hard to be on the team, right? If you're in North Carolina, that says something. If you're West Coast or East Coast, you know, if you're on a team, that says something. I mean, that's if, a huge reason why we started this podcast and why I started the newsletter. I was like, how can I get veteran entrepreneurs a moment of spotlight? I mean, it's not much. I've got I've got seven thousand subscribers on the on the newsletter. So it's not he did a massive audience, but there's seven thousand people that are going to read about like uh, um, Sean Haggerty, who we just did last week's on. You know, seven thousand yeah. people just read about Sean Haggerty, a former Navy SEAL who started a brewery that yep. does organic and all uh, sustainable ingredients. So there's something for it, and then we have them on the podcast, yeah. and then that gets more uh, more traction. So yeah, what we what we see this becoming is. A, a mini platform for veteran entrepreneurs to come on and, and, and get a moment of, of celebrity status that hopefully can promote their brand, promote their product, and promote their, their business, whatever it is. That's absolutely vital, man. I love what you're doing too. And that's so good. Uh, and that's, that's fantastic. So your podcast, it's huge because it, it identifies you as the entrepreneurs that you are. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll put that in there. Snuck it in. Yeah, I did, man. No, but seriously, we're gonna like... coin it. We'll we'll put that in there. Well, actually, we have a guy coming on doing uh, IP. I think in April on on the webinars. So we'll get that trademarked. We'll figure out how he does it. Dude, put it on a shirt and sell it, man. I don't, I don't need any money from that. <laughs> Entrepreneur. That's, that's. I mean, seriously, what you're doing is you're setting yourself up in that space. That's your niche, and there's a lot of people that are looking for exactly what you're providing. And because you're doing a podcast where you're doing it once a week, twice a week. You're going out into Google and then you're putting it on YouTube, the second biggest search engine. So it's also owned by Google. So if anyone Googles you, they're now going to see that you have the answers, which means you can provide a solution, which means you are you hear the that, experts. everybody? I have the answers. I know everything. <laughs> so true. So, so true. It says it on LinkedIn. I'm a top voice in entrepreneurship and public speaking. Boom. I've earned those. Yeah. And you know what? Let's talk about that. Because if you're getting ready to transition or if you're, if you're looking at LinkedIn, you need to do that, man. And mm -hmm. It's not just for the badge because the questions that AI generates there are pretty thought provoking. It makes oh, you yeah. think. They're great. And they grow you. It grows you. So anyone who has the badge, I know they spent time thinking about what it is that they say they're an expert at. And then LinkedIn goes, yeah, we yeah, they are. So you got that validation and you need to do that. And for me with leadership, that's a big one. It took me two months to get. So 
the, I was I was stoked when I got it, but I learned a crap ton going through that process. And that's that's just who we are, man. I mean, you're gonna give me a challenge, I'm I'm gonna knock down that challenge, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna get there. You know, like this guy got a top voice. <laughs> I'm done yeah. with him. <laughs> that's another one, man. People like to see you succeed, just not more than them. <laughs> well, what's that, what's that saying? The only man that ever wants to see you succeed is your dad. Yo, that's deep, man. That's deep. Yeah. The, the only man that well, will be excited that about you Cole, succeeding. But, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of tr- nothing would make me happier than to see like my, my sons grow up and be successful. Like that's right. And it's not that I, I don't want to see like Kevin you succeed or Atlas you succeed because yeah. I do like 100. Yeah. percent um, But like there, it, it it is nothing in comparison to your sons or your kids, right? Mm-hmm. That's right. So there's 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 some truth to that quote for sure. That's I right. think it's more of like the 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 general sense, not people you necessarily know, but like the the random spectators, the the, the people yeah, out in yeah. public. They see well, you, and yeah, they, they get excited about you you doing well, but. No one's yeah. going to genuinely be happy. They're, they're going to have some level of animosity, resentment, uh, jealousy. But we it's lived just, in it's that human world, nature man. that you want what other people have. No, man. Competition's phenomenal, right? And Tony Rob was on a conference with Tony Robbins. I did the private group with him, and he was talking about comp, uh, competition. And competition isn't what most people think it is, it's actually a way to level each other up. If you're. Mm-hmm. In competition, you're in collaboration with making each other better. So whenever you're looking at it in the, the negative sense, which a lot of people are conditioned to do, you're looking at it wrong, man. Like, So I'm in competition with you guys right now. I'm trying to provide the best, the best information that I can for your audience, for your show. And you're trying to check me to make sure that I'm giving you everything and not holding any of it back. This is competition right now. We're having competition. And what's really good about this at our level, Army, Air Force, and Navy. Navy and Marine talking. Corps. I got both. I got yeah, both. You, I mean, we got them all. I'm cl- Except I for the Space Force. Hey, come on. Like, and Coast Guard. Yeah. Come on. Don't forget those guys. <laughs> yeah. Poor, yeah, poor yeah, guys. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, like, we're talking at a, a joint service level at an elite level where we're able to check each other and bring out that information that you're not going to get with some Joe Smo who's 20 something, 30 something, and just knows entrepreneur life. Dude, we've experienced the world of culture. We know different languages. We know a whole lot more people that do a whole lot more doing than a lot of people will ever know. You're in the, the number one corporation in the world and you're at the top of it. Think about that. It's the biggest employer in the world. And they said, you are here at the tip of the spear. We're going to trust you to do the no-fail missions. And then afterwards, what? We're all here. We're all here talking, man. (laughs) We're talking about how we can continue that because we care about that. And that's all the community. But, you know, that's that's just who we are, man. It's, uh, It's amazing that you're doing that. So competition. Don't shy away from it and don't be afraid of it, man. No, oh, never. It's, it's so much of what we, we've done, what we continue to do. Um, you know, we, we, there's, there's other people out there that are doing podcasts. There's other people out there talking entrepreneurship. There's other people out there talking yeah. about military transition. We're just combining it into our own little, <clears throat> into our own flavor and, yeah. and marketing it as something that people will find interesting because there's a lot of, it is. Th- there's a lot of stuff out there that, that, that intertwine with one another that'll help you help make you better. And I think a lot of veterans will, will benefit from hearing about the, the options that are out there with, with entrepreneurship. You don't have to go no. work for Amazon or Google or something like that to make good money. Um, but you definitely scary. don't need to work at those companies to, to find purpose after the military. Like Amen. you probably find more purpose work swinging a hammer at a, at a uh, small construction firm than you will working at Amazon. Uh, but I mean, that's, that's 100%. just, yeah, that, it's yeah. like building things Amen. with your hands, doing things, working with good people, um, and not just doing it for the, the bottom line. Because what, what, I don't remember if Amazon or Apple is the biggest company in the world, but one of them in terms of um, revenue. But you know they're go- they're both going through layoffs right now, so yeah, there's no job security at those. So no matter how big a company is, you're never going to have a secure spot until you you build out uh, something of your own. Yeah, uh, I've worked with Amazon a couple times. Um, 
uh, in when I was in the military and uh, they're, they're a different animal. Uh, I talked to one of the people that's a direct manager here in the local area and uh, they go through people like quickly. They churn. Like, they, it's just chew them up and spit them out. Um, and I'm like, man, I don't think I could ever be a part of an organization like that. I mean, I, I, I knew, I knew everybody on my team's shadow because we spent that much time together. You know what I mean? And, and that builds a trust that, uh, that I like to build into my community. So, um, one of the things that I liked about Sean's, uh, w on the first episode, one of the things I liked about Sean's is he's talking about his employees and there's a caring level there. Um, mm -hmm. I have a, a different approach to it uh, because I don't like to pay taxes. <laughs> I uh, I hire everybody through like Upwork um, and I look for them to be overseas. So like I would hire Greg in a minute. <laughs> he's, an American, <laughs> he's an American in the Netherlands. I'm like, Greg, you, uh, you want to help me out, man? And uh, <laughs> I send money over there. I don't have to do at, a 1099. At a certain point though, you, you have to hire actual people like when I mean, like, yeah. You need people behind behind the desk and yeah. and uh, churning the beers and stuff like that. You, it depends you on your industry. It does. Actual people. Yeah. But yeah, it, 100 percent. Like whenever you can, especially yeah. if you if you're just starting out, don't hire well, a bunch of people. Everyone thinks it's it, it's it's a sense of status. To be like I've got a hundred employees. Like you have a hundred liabilities. What you have? Yeah. No one cares. Um, how many? How many can? Not saying cut people because you you know trying to save profit. I'm saying you should probably try and streamline things and do yeah. you really need a hundred people or is that just your ego saying we want to grow this and we need all these people because there's, yeah. there's so much uh fluff and fat at, at companies people are like especially the bigger ones yeah it's just like what do you do here so dallas's point too like the world the world is flat man i, I mean i it think is. we're going to see this more and more and more is that like you're going this, what you need is provided overseas at a much cheaper rate and at the same level of quality. And uh, I mean, that's going to be, it's just going to be a growing thing. It's going to be a growing theme, but um, to, yeah. to Sean's episode, I mean, like you can tell that that dude, like, that, and this is what's He's, missing in, yeah. in most companies. Like selflessness is just like, if you, if, if you are truly selfless, I mean, there the sky is the limit. If you have a team that is truly selfless, and if that's the culture that you're building, that that is the that is the missing ingredient in so many corporations. Um, mm. Everybody's just looking out for for number one uh, when it comes to navigating corporate world. So, that's so that, and that's why I love entrepreneurship, and that's why I love working with Kevin. Is like we you know we're we're very much aligned in our values and what we're looking to to get out of this. So, yeah, it's it's been a blast. That's awesome. Well, I will give you my hack. I look for expats on Upwork. There you go. I like it. I, I still that's, hire that's What are you hiring people for? So uh, I started this journey on, uh, and this is what I'll suggest for everybody because it's the best way. Um, I started writing books with my kid. He came in. He was like, hey, how do I make money? I'm like, bro, everybody that had billions of dollars whose house that I've been with has a book. So let's start there. So we started working on a book together. And I took lessons out of this, you know, the rule three. And I made them into a kid's series. So I did it opposite, like everyone else. Everyone writes their, their hua book, you know, and they're like, look, I'm a warrior, you know. And, uh, and then they're like, kids' books. Jocko did that, right? Um, so uh, I did the opposite way. I wrote a kid's series on leadership, and I published it. And the next day, we're on the bestseller list. I'm like, well, what do we have here? This is interesting. So I was like, let's do it again. And we did it again. And then we got higher on the bestseller list. I'm like, so I took notes and the third time we got to number one, I was like, yeah, and that's on my website. In fact, I'm going to put that out. Um, I will put out on my website, uh, leaders-kid.com slash, what do you want this to be? Um, I'll say we'll harder. put this in the comments. Yeah, I'll put the, I'll say slash harder. And, uh, and I have a best selling kit that you can have for free. And it's the exact process that I used to get to number one. It's nine steps. I wrote it all down. I sell it, but you guys can have it. Um, anyways, this process, That's I awesome. followed it to a T and I did it again. And the fourth time we broke Amazon, they didn't have enough books. They couldn't, they couldn't print them. So I got to number two and then they sold out. Like Amazon was like, we're done. I'm like, this sucks. So uh, I stopped it when we hit number one. And that's the process that I, that I did so that everyone could be a, a, a number one bestseller. Uh, and then I hired a firm to do my other book. Uh, and that was an interesting journey that I learned a lot from. But I suggest 
highly suggest that if you're going to be an entrepreneur, even if you're going to sell your business, which is what Kiyosaki would want you to do, build your business, make it packaged, have all the employees, and then say, here you go. And someone will spend millions on your business. And uh, Cody Sanchez talks about that a lot, where mm -hmm. she takes a business and she makes it better. Um, that's how you get out of the, the game. That's actually how you get more time and all that. But you need to have a book because the book doesn't go with the business, stays with you. And once you go through the journey once, like I did with the, with the books, I was able to ask the right questions on my other book. And that's why my other book went number one in three categories when it was launched. And then they were like, hey, let's try more categories because I was asking them, can we try more categories? Because I've done this before. And they're like, yeah. And then they put it in three more categories. I'm like, bang, number one. And then I was like, hey, uh, I think we could probably go a little bit more. And they're like, okay, let's try it. But if I had not been through this journey, I would not have known to ask those questions. So I like that Amazon we, was like, yeah, we're game. We can do this. We'll play this yeah. game. Yeah. So anyone could be an author. Okay. Uh, what I'm giving you is the opportunity to be a best-selling author, and that opens up doors to stages and podcasts. Podcast is where I would stay. And that's why I told you earlier, I'm, I'm doing 100 podcasts as fast as possible before I start my own. And I got all these little lessons from everyone's shows. And I'm in the top podcasts, and I'm selling the same thing, right? Nothing. <laughs> I'm saying I'm giving you everything because I just want you to know I know what I'm talking about. And if you employ what I'm giving you and it works, then you know what I'm talking about. So I know you're going to come back to me for more answers. And that's all I do. Uh, SEO optimization through multiple shows. When I'm on all these podcasts and you Google me, you're going to see lots of shorts on YouTube because a lot of these shows do shorts. And then that gets you know a couple thousand views every time. And then a couple thousand views and then a couple thousand views. And if you add it all up, I've got millions of views right now. And I've only been out for like eight months. So start early because they don't care when you start. Is tell your what's your, your podcast uh, going to be on? You know, um, definitely working on that. Uh, so, <laughs> definitely <laughs> working on it. Yeah. So <laughs> no clue. I have no idea. So like my niche is the decision cycle for leaders. Like I can make you a fast decision maker that's super effective. And what that does, whenever you process the decision cycle faster is it allows you to learn from failure and allows mm -hmm. you to progress at a rate that most people are not comfortable with. But once you start learning that failure is just part of the process, and that's been documented multiple times, and you start learning from your failures, and like, like Sean said, you know, we're just we're going to suck less than we did yesterday or whatever, however he no, said no, no. it. Say, yeah. say it right. <laughs> Fuck it up less a little every day. <laughs> yeah. But seriously, that's the, the journey, right? You know, Lincoln wasn't, he didn't become the president. He failed a bunch of times trying to become a senator. And then now everyone knows who Lincoln is, right? So if you continuously press at this, you're going to go. You're going to go. So, uh, so is that my, all you want to talk about, though, leadership? Or do you uh, want to? It's not. Because Greg and I were talking about that when we had yeah. you know, venture veterans and elite ventures and a couple other things. We're like, this is just very business focused. Yeah. And we, we want to talk about other things. Like I know Greg is super passionate about mental health and stuff like that. He, he struggled with, with his own level of stuff from, from leaving the military. Um, and so we want to be able to talk about mental health and mm. having a positive mindset and you know, being able to accomplish more. Uh, transitioning yeah. out of the military, that's a tough one for everybody. I mean, you're still, you're yeah. deep in that transition right now. I mean, you're, you're having a smooth one, it seems like, but I mean, there's, there's issues. I'm sure no, that man. there's stuff going on behind the scenes that you're not talking about. No. Um, and so being able to to air that dirty laundry out, talk about the different things that I've been through, that Greg's been through. If you have things you want to share with people that are like, yeah. this is, this sucks. And I did not expect it. These are all things we want to pile on in. Um, and it really just opened up the aperture of what we can talk about and who we can bring on. And it, it, it makes it much more natural. Cause I like talking business. I talk yeah. entrepreneurship all the time. Mm -hmm. but do I want to only talk entrepreneurship? I don't think Greg does either. We, we like talking about some of the other things that, that are important to us. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why the self deprecating humor of harder, not smarter came in. I love <laughs> yeah. it. Because sometimes you just got to put your head through a brick wall. You know, there isn't well, a smart way to get through that wall. Go straight through it. Greg, Greg's going to say something. Yeah. I, say, I was just going to say, I, there's a, I forget the name of the book. And I'll have to send it to you afterwards. But there's this book, and it would depend on what the purpose of your podcast is. Is it a business development tool? Are you just trying to get to gain an audience? Um, mm -hmm. But if it is a business development tool, 
thinking about you know who it is you're trying to sell to and using those people as your podcast guests yeah. and using it as an opportunity to spotlight them in hopes that you can win a little bit of good favor with them um, and that eventually, you know, if they ever need your service and whatever you're doing in leadership consulting or leadership coaching, um, that they would, you know, obviously turn to the person that they went to the, on the podcast with, as opposed to just some random Joe Schmo that they read about online, right? Yeah. So, All right. I'll, I'll figure out. I'll figure out that book. It's a good one, though. So, your podcast is phenomenal for for a lot of reasons. One, when people see you. Uh, the more they see you, the more they become familiar with you. The more they become familiar with you, the more they trust you. So if you're giving them something and they see you all the time, like if this gets broken up, like let's, let's take this one, for example. Uh, we've talked about business. We've talked about um, how to get on a uh, bestseller list. We've talked about uh, personal journeys. And there's a lot of different nuggets you can pull out of this. If you just take one of those things and you chop it up into a short, then you get to share that with the world, right? They see your face. Um, and then you hit all these different audiences. And this is why it's hard for me to say, I'm going to have my podcast on this. It's exactly what you're saying. I, I could talk mental health. I actually have a podcast uh, Friday on mental health. Uh, it's called Good Grief. And it talks about the stages of grief. And I talk about the first guy I ever lost to suicide. Um, that's what I'm going to talk about. So I don't always talk the same stories. And they're going to get a new one out of me. Um, the last one I did that blew up was a, a tech podcast where I talked about, um, yeah, and it's hard, uh, like getting in a physical altercation with somebody in uh, Indonesia, and I couldn't do anything about it. I mean, I'm a combatives instructor. I used to bounce in college. I know how to answer violence with violence, and I was told when I'm in a suit, I'm not allowed to do that, and this dude just clocked me in the face after I was full up guard on him. I was like, you just hit a diplomat. And then I had a decision to make, right? And I was like, do I just snap this guy? Because I know I can. And I'm looking around, man. You know, all we always do, I'm looking at, I'm looking at my left. I'm like, all these dudes are his friends. I can take them all. Because I'm like that, right? <laughs> I'm going to get them. I'm going to get them. Like, I, I went through line. If you're a Marine, did you go through line, line combatives? No, that, that McMap. Oh, uh, make me okay. Yeah, so line I, got a little aggressive. I think a couple yes. of Marines killed some people because everything ended with a, a it always a heel ends with stomp death. to the face. It cer certainly does. So, um, yeah, sweep. My and buddy stomp. helped develop that program. Both sweep programs. and stomp. Vito did. You know Vito. Yeah. Yep. So I got a combatives instructor in that. And I'm looking at him. I'm like, I can stomp all these people. <laughs> I got this, man. Because in order to graduate from that class to be a, an instructor, you have to kill like 16 people in a row. They call it the swarm. So I'm looking at it, I'm like, this is just like training. You know, <laughs> I'm just in a suit and it's okay. <laughs> so, you know, I'm making this decision and I'm like, man, I'll lose my job in the agency. I won't be able to ever come back. This is kind of a sidelines of history job. And I'm processing all this for the first time ever, man. And, uh, and you know, I pushed him off and I, and I got out of there. I didn't fight and I got the call and I've never not, I've never not fight. I, I'm always a fighter. I'm not a runner. I'm a fighter. So if you start something, it's going to end. Um, and that was the first time it didn't, it didn't go that way. So uh, I had to process a lot. And the lead, the trip lead for the, the military came out with the, the mill aid. He was a SEAL. And they're like, hey, tell us what happened. I'm like, can you just let me process this, man? Because I'm going through this emotional roller coaster, right? And it's the stages of grief played out. Shock. Like, this dude just hit me. What? <laughs> Anger. I'm going to crush this guy, you know? And then uh, fear, like, I'm going to lose my job. And then when I, I got met with the team, right, and I'm looking at a freaking trident, I'm, I'm squirting one because I don't know what the, what what just happened, you know? So I, I, I teared up in an eye, and he's like, whatever. And he just leaves. And, and I'm like, oh, gosh, man, what just happened? And so I had to process all these emotions really quick because it's the first time I've ever done it like that. And I grew. I grew as a person, man. Um, but like when that got out, you know, they're like, "Hey, you cried." I'm like, "You want you want to go?" I mean, a little you wanna, bit. You want to fight me, here, man? You want to fight me? I mean, because I'm down for a fight. Uh, but we ended up getting a lot out of that trip. But like those type, of, those are the stories that I'll share with other people. Um, and it's just all over the place, man. Depending on where they are as a podcast. That's why when I was watching your shows, 
and I'm and I've I've been a subscriber to you guys. I've been Kevin and I've been connected for at least six months, and I'll share stuff that I see on my side in Phoenix as entrepreneurs start to come together. And I'm like, here's an idea that you might want to to do because it's awesome seeing people in person. But back to like this. This whole platform could be anything you want it to be, and it shouldn't be just one thing. Mm -hmm. A podcast shouldn't be just one thing. So I like the harder, not smarter mantra and the fact that we're all over the place on these discussions because something's going to hit for somebody. And whenever you open the aperture of discussion, you're opening value for everybody, man. And they're going to get something out of it. That's, that's why it's so hard. You know, what's it going to be about? I don't know, man. My niche is leadership decisions. I have three products. If you're an entrepreneur, you should have three products. You should have a low-level product, which is a book. You know, for me, it's a book. This is, I did it once, get paid for it for the rest of my life. Bank account has my kid's name on it. So that's generational wealth, right? I did it once and I'm done. Okay, that's not something you learn in school. They don't tell you, mm -hmm. write a paper and publish it. They say, write a paper and I'll grade it. I don't care what that's you grade it is. That's honestly something they need to, to revisit. Expect, yeah. like, up, update school because English class was a giant waste of my time. Reading some of those books, I couldn't yeah. tell, I probably didn't read half of them, just kind of like these no. books are dumb. They need to revamp it to be like how to publish your own book, how to write content on social yeah. media, how to write a newsletter, like something that actually, actually can be yeah. applicable and useful and bring in and, and value to somebody's life. For Writing sure. a book report on a book that you're never going to read again or even think about, about again, waste yeah. of time. Waste. Such a waste. Such a way. Yeah, and you're forcing a subject on somebody that some they're not interested in. Like, I don't. Uh, yeah, I, I'm with you, man. I did Spark Notes. That was, that was all yeah. about some Spark Notes. I honestly man. didn't read for pleasure for years uh, until after, well after college, because like I hated reading the books that they had, and like if this is what reading is, I don't like it. It's not for me. I think the first book that got me back into reading was Dave's book, um, Dave Goggins. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. All right, man, I'll read this. Actually, it reads just like he talks. So I'm like, yeah, this is good. And I never got to uh, to be out with Dave, uh, but a lot of his buddies, a lot of his old teammates, I worked with them, and they were like, yep, he's just like that. I'm like, it sounds just like you, dude. And he's like, yeah. So, I mean, I read that book. I was like, yeah, I can write a book like this. So I kind of took I took his flavor, and he's I took – jo He is. And I took Jocko's, like, lessons learned, and then I put all of that into, you know, my, my books, you can pick it up, read it in five minutes. Because at the end of each chapter, I have everything that you need to read. And if you want to read how Secret Service was going to arrest me for stealing one of their cars, that's a story. You know what I mean? You can that's read the stories. Right there. I like that. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's that? <laughs> so there's a clickbait comment right there. It's like, do you guys uh, yeah. want to learn about this? Get my book. Yeah. Here's the website. It's, it, yeah, I guess. It's in there. <laughs> But like, uh, yeah, I got stories in there like that, that were, you see, yeah, Secret Service is like, yeah. So I come from a, a unique world. So whenever they brought me into the White House, they put me on these missions like Indonesia and like the Red Bank. You know, anyways, I got a lot of these missions that people didn't really want that were dangerous, you would say. So um, the West Bank out in Israel was my trip site. And. Uh, we didn't stay over there. We stayed in Israel. So every Smart. time you, you drive in, we'd convoy with Secret Service. And Secret Service would provide that security element or whatever. And uh, game day, which is when the president shows up, um, everyone's in place. So um, we have we have a military contingent that I can't talk about, but everyone was in place. And they showed up with the convoy. And the vehicle that showed up was not the right vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> they they did, we have like we have gear let's just put that i have a lot of kit that, that has to go with the president to make him the commander in chief and um the commander in chief didn't have his gear <laughs> couldn't fit it all in the car they gave me so i called the rsa uh that's a regional security advisor that's the uh top security guy in the country and i'm like hey bro where's my where's my truck and he's like oh man um let me get that for you so he sends me the gun truck, Secret Service's gun truck, which is what they carry all their weapons in. And I, I, I get the truck and it's locked. And I'm like, we're taking this truck. <laughs> <laughs> so the guys are like, um, well, what do you want to do? I'm like, find bolt cutters. Go. go. So, you know, uh, I got my community is full of people that are in either the White House or they're in, in special operations. So they know how to provide. They know how to provide what I'm asking for. So they came back and improvise. 
I didn't ask where they got the bolt cutters, by the way. I just said, give them to me because I don't want you cut. So clocked it open, rolled up the stupid box truck door, and there they are, a bunch of box weapons. There was no weapons in there. You know, I'm like, they're like, what are we going to do? I'm like, put the stuff in here. Let's go. <laughs> so, so we did the mission, and uh, the SAC, the special agent in charge, hits me up from the helicopter. And he's like, that was amazing. I heard that you pulled some some strings and ran through walls. I was like, yeah, thanks, sir. You know, good to go. And uh, we got back, and, you know, his transportation guy uh, calls me. And, and you know, is this Captain Altman? Because I was a captain at the time. I might have been a major. I was like, yeah, yeah, who is this? And uh, I thought it was one of my guys messing with me. They're like, this is special agent so-and-so. We're going to arrest you. I'm like, ah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when? Now? Come get me. <laughs> and they were like, this is serious. And I'm like, whatever, dude. I'm like, who is this? And I was like, okay. Um, and then I looked at my phone and I was like, oh, legit. It is. It is. I'm like, look, man. Who says that? Like. <laughs> I'm going to arrest you, not yeah. just show Come up on, and arrest man. you. It's like, I'm going to do yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so they're like, yeah, we're going to get you on Grand Theft Auto. I was like, yeah, good luck with that, man. That's good. I got to go. So <laughs> <laughs> then my, my uh, trip lead calls me here. Like, what happened? I'm like, dude, man, did you want the mission to happen or not? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, but you should have. I'm like, okay, well, I didn't. So what do you, what do you want to you arrest me? It. You want to arrest me for getting the mission done? Talk to the sack. And then, you know, they did. And then everything got squashed. But yeah, that's in there. And I talk about biases because when I tell that story, you immediately think it's a dude, but it was a it was a female. It was like, hey, I'm going to arrest you. I'm like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be fun. It's going to be real fun. I look but yeah, to I mean, I don't talk about any of that. I don't talk about like, I talk about like, yeah, I, I talk about that. And but the lesson is biases. Like we all have them. Like immediately, I just dismissed her. I thought it was. One of my guys getting somebody up to something. You know what I mean? I was just like, <laughs> I did not two two shades to the wind. I was like, whatever, I don't care. But uh, but yeah, no, look, those kind of stories they they matter, right? And so you got to put that stuff in a book because your kids are going to read that stuff. Um, so back to three products, right? Everyone has to have a product that's like at the ninety nine cent level. That's an entry level introduction. You know, you're going to see the picture. I always have the little picture on the back of the book, right? Like, that's mm -hmm. me. From how long ago? Shh. <laughs> uh, that one's, uh, that's about a year ago before I had a okay. beard. Before I had this magical red beard. They're nice, though, aren't they? Yeah, I love them. Greg? I see you're, you're uh, working on it. My wife likes me to be, to rock a clean-shaven face, so. Using the wife. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a good husband. I'm a good husband. I'm a good husband. All right. Keep telling yourself <laughs> I'm a that. good husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Um, so I was going to shave it too. I was, I was going to shave it. Cause for like the, when I started my business, I was still in, uh, like I said, I, I looked at my jobs and I, I looked at where I was going and I had a trajectory up in the military, but I, I didn't want to do any of those jobs. I mean, like if I don't get to be on, if I don't get to go visit people and if I don't get to go talk to, you know, people that are doing actual stuff all the time. I, I, I'm just not for that, man. So mm -hmm. they're going to stick me in another command. I actually, uh, they, they pushed me back to Phoenix and I, and I got the world's largest fighting command garrison ju job. So um, the, I was going to say jury duty, but it wasn't. I had a really, I had a really cool uh, team that was phenomenal and I got to continue doing that. And they dumped, they, stupidly, they let me fly an F-16. And I was like, you don't let me do that? All right. So, cool. yeah, they my retirement, they let me fly at F-16, we got supersonic, and they did all the missions, and I threw up twice, and it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely not a, I'm definitely not a pilot. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're like, um, yeah, if you want to, you want to fly it? I'm like, you won't let me? Yeah, yeah, I'll fly it. So, I, you know, I, I flew it, and they were like, stop. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> But yeah, fastest job a, you ever got fired from. Yeah, yeah it was right yeah, for sure. <laughs> now it was definitely one of those those jobs that I you know I didn't think I could get any better. So I stopped in. in uh, I was like, I'm I'm going to go out and do what I'm doing now, which is essentially talking to people who who need me. Um. So my second product is a course 
I do uh, courses in, in person. Right now, I don't do anything online. So I help veteran-owned businesses in the Phoenix area. And I'll go in and I'll assess their team for them. And then I'll, I'll boost up their team using proven tactics. So I don't believe in goals. I don't believe in goals. Goals don't work. I believe in targets. So what I used to do in our community was I would have a little silhouette. And I'd be like, here's the bullseye. This is what we're going to hit. Uh, here are our outside parameters that I need you to hit too. So I get everyone on target. And then we would start to hit the target. And then we could refine depending on what leadership was telling us. And right now I'm leadership. So when I look at the target modeling, I go, what do you want to hit? If you focus on one thing, you're going to hit that thing. Mm -hmm. And what happens with goals is you set up a whole bunch of goals and they look like resolutions eventually. And then when they don't get hit, they get forgotten about. You can't look downrange at a target and not know it's there. So I'm big on targeting. That's a great way to put it. I, I, I'm big on targeting, man. I mean, you look at it different ways. You can hit it from different ways. You can shoot at it from different ways. You got different ways you can hit that target. You can look at the team hitting the target. There's so many different ways that you can look at it, but targets are where it's at for me. So I teach targeting. I don't teach goals. And the targeting model works because I follow up six months afterwards and they're like, this worked. We did that. We did this target. In fact, we set up three more targets and we fit all of them. We're working on our fifth target. We're moving so fast. I'm like, it's amazing what happens when you focus. Mm -hmm. And that's how I bring that in. And I talk about breathing. So I teach like a, a way to connect your, your brain to your body through what used to be box breathing. And we've all done it, right? Um, but I call it three breathing and I change it and make it faster. So how three breathing works is you breathe in until you feel uh, your, your brain start to connect to your body. So I breathe in and I hold it. And then I feel the connection and I know my brain is ready to tell my body I'm in charge. And then I'll exhale and then I can immediately hit whatever it is that I'm going to start going after. So I do that before big presentations. If I'm speaking to thousands of people, I box breathe, but I do it in a three breathing pattern. So I can do it in two to three seconds. No one sees it. It's not noticeable. And then I come in on charge instead of a little bit off. And then I get into it, right? Everyone starts, a, starts like that. They're like, oh, I'm a little nervous or they say whatever they're going to say. But I don't start like that immediately. Kind I'm coming out breaker. confident. Yeah. It's remarkable out. how, how uh, much traction breath, breath work is getting these days. It's amazing. Uh, like it's something simple that everyone just takes for granted what you do to stay alive. It's like there's so much more yeah. uh, of an effect that you can have on your body and your mind through breathing uh, yeah. that it, it's just now well, in Western society. I'm sure other, other areas have, have been thinking about it for a while. But, you know, it's, it's becoming the trendy thing. Like it was yoga. Now, now it's breath work. Yeah. And ice baths. Don't forget the ice bath. Oh, don't forget the ice. Yeah, Joe's on the ice baths a lot, man. Joe Rogan's always in the ice bath. My buddy's opening up a, a cold plunge spot here in uh, in San Diego. Oh, he is. We're actually gonna have to have him on the on the podcast. Uh, Shannon Daniels. I love I love ice baths. I mean, you yeah. got to take a picture to validate that you actually, you know, ice yeah, bath. Yeah, of to. course, it's mandatory. Yeah, if it's not on Instagram, it didn't happen. That, that's yes, correct. Exactly. But no, you I'm, I'm have to have floating believer. ice in there too, so it looks colder. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm a fan of that. Um, so that's what I do at my mid level. So that's like a, a three to five thousand dollar package for you know a quick setup for a veteran owned business. Um, five hundred dollars per person, and then after six months, I'll go back and evaluate, and then I'll give them other things like how to how to program their subconscious. That's a big thing that people don't do, um, and that's very powerful. And for your community, it's real easy. It goes like this: before you go to bed, you set up your next day, and before you go to bed, you review what you did that day, and you set up your next day. And if you're always, always tracking it, writing it down, you're taking it out of here and making it real. And whenever you do that, you start setting up targets. Whenever you start setting up targets, you start hitting the targets, and you start finding new targets. And when you start finding new targets, you start moving faster and your brain's always subconsciously looking for that win because you program mm -hmm. it the night before to start working on your day. So you have eight, whatever, nine, 15 hours for some people of sleep. It's, uh, it's uh, all set up to, to make you succeed and you engage your reticulator activating system, right? That's whenever. It probably helps you sleep brain. too, getting that stuff yeah. out of your brain so you're not. It just, sure does. Yeah. What's your take on writing it versus digitally typing it out? Yeah, yeah, you have to a, write it, man. Yeah. No. Either I'm way it gets out. 
it, either way it gets out, but when you write it, it's so much better. Because uh, your body's actually, I mean, there's something about writing that connects at a deeper level. So, you know, that's, uh, that's me last night. This is my last night, right? And then I hit the targets, and then I have a whole book of this where I'll start just pumping in these little notes um, every day. And I go through these things, man. And then I'm able to recall it a lot faster, too, because it's, it's relevant. So, so here's so that, a bigger question. Do you hold on to those for your kids? Yeah, um, I say, do you hold on to them? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> like, Do you review them? History is written by the victors. <laughs> <laughs> so um some of them yeah i do review them bro um so some of the the old journals that i started at they they were when i was married and i said some things in there that uh i no longer feel because <laughs> at points you see things that you want to see so here's one for picking your 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 number one choice in life is who are you going to spend your life with and who's going to be your partner Who's going to be there for you? And if you're looking at them, I'm, I'm going to totally blow some people's minds here saying this because they're not going to want to hear it. But it's probably going to hit somebody hard. If you're looking at your spouse and they are no longer supportive, in fact, if they are holding you back, if they are not giving you words of affirmation, a physical touch, all the five love languages, you know, if they're not doing that for you, ask yourself, are they really a partner? Because you can find things whenever you're looking for them. And for me, I was trying to find things in a, a situation in a relationship that just wasn't working. And it wasn't bad. It's just we grew differently. Like I grew up in a community that that fostered a little bit different mindset than the community that she was in whenever I wasn't around. So when I was gone, being around people of like mindedness, and I'd come back with that different mindset, it made her uncomfortable. So she would try to bring me back into a mindset that made her more comfortable, but it also prevented me from doing things like, like writing a book. I didn't start writing a book until after I got a divorce. You know, I didn't start my business until after I got a divorce. I didn't start helping more people until after I got a divorce because I was being held back by somebody I thought was helping me, but she wasn't. <laughs> so I took those things, I took those pages out of my journal so that my kids don't read that and think, well, why'd they get divorced? Mm -hmm. And But I'm not also bad-mouthing their mom, you know, you know, because that's their mom. They only get one mom, and she's not a bad person. It's just we went like this. Mm -hmm. So that constant assessment, man. Like I said, every day that I was in the community, I showed up to work, and I was, I was a full up around, man. I was gym. I was square on, on target. You know, I was always proficient. People would ask me, like, why are you going to the gym or why are you going to the range? And I'm like, what do you mean? And they're like, you're not on a mission as much as everyone else. I'm like, but when I am, it matters. So I'm going to be there, you know, <laughs> a full up round. It's all about honing your, your skills. Like, yeah, dude, that's... for us now, we're, we're trying to get as many uh, podcast guests as possible. Like start churning out content, yeah. have these conversations, get comfortable talking about different topics. Uh, you know, whatever it is you're doing, just be sure. the best at it. If yeah. I, I don't need to be on the range anymore. I still like shooting. I go every once in a while with some friends, but that's right. You know, th this is this is the new thing that that we need to hone and and become proficient at. I got rid of some of my rifles, but I just made other ones better. I, <laughs> I mean, I can't, I can't. I, I like making gunpowder. I've got man. a closet of them. They're they're there. Yeah, I'm not gonna get rid of them. I, it that's still who it. I am. Oh, I got rid of the AK. I'm like, this is stupid. <laughs> Why do I have this? Uh, but Can other that? than that, no, I mean, I got, I got all my hunting rifles. Uh, uh, I took an elk last year. And um, uh, people, and I got banned from TikTok. <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> yeah, man, because I was out there. I was like, pow, pow, pow. And I was hitting long range because I knew it was going to be a long shot, man. Because it's like 2% of elk hunters actually harvest an elk. I'm like, if I get shot, man, I ain't missing. So I was at the range, pow, 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 pow. And I was, I was putting out messages like, hey, man, you got to stay consistent. You got to stay in the game. There's perishable skills like speaking. It will go away if you don't do it. You know, your message has to be on point. It's just like target. And you know, I'm a big targeting guy. So I'm like, target, target, target. And TikTok's like, that's violence. I'm like, it's shooting. It's shooting a paper. You know, and so they're like, warning, 
And I was like, warning. And then when I took the oak, I was like, this is the journey, right? Because people like to see that. I'm like, working out. Because I had to take five trips into the woods to get all the meat out. And that was like five miles. My commander at the time came out to help me. Uh, he was a phenomenal guy. He's like, you got one? I'll be out there. So he drove like an hour and a half. He, he helped us cycle through. He grabbed his pack. And uh, we hoofed it, man. But like, that's work. You got to have, you got to have the physical stamina to do that. Um, and then I showed like my family processing the meat and they're like, you know, that's not right. I'm like, where do you think meat comes from, man? It's like that. I know where this one came from. So like we processed it. I showed the whole family was involved in like processing the meat. We still have elk meat, man. But, um, and then I, you know, I showed the harvest, the, the butchering, the processing, and they're like, this is gory. And I'm like, Looks like I'm losing my TikTok account. I feel like you're also a habitual line stepper. Like you saw that warning, you're like, challenge accepted. Yep. Yeah. I'm like, we'll see. Yeah. I got more views before I got before I got banned than anything else. (laughs) They're like, go. I'm like, I am. Show TikTok who's boss. (laughs) Yeah. But that's the number one social platform in America right now. They just they're not our audience. They're people who want to be entertained, not people Mm -hmm. who want to be better. So. Uh, I stopped really slowing. I sl- slowed down. There's like five followers on TikTok that actually want to get better. And I, and I still publish to my friends, but I don't publish like I used to. On TikTok, so it's draining. It's draining managing multiple platforms. Like I spend so much time just on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. I tell Greg all the time, like if, if we start going on to, to Instagram, he's going to have to manage that. I think I've deleted that off my phone 15 times. Mm. As soon as that thing's on my phone, it's like heroin. It's just like, scrolling scrolling, yeah. scrolling i can't for be real. on that it's for not real. healthy for me but you're in a business of so, making yeah, going that's why that's why we need to that's why we need a skill bridge intern oh god yeah to manage our ig yeah we need one yeah and that's an easy process too you should do it do a skill bridge um mm-hmm. it's a letter and what they'll do and then you know the skill bridge process let me let me pop into that a little bit just for your for your audience skill bridge process you have to identify yourself as a company um, Skillbridge will come back to you and say, okay, we recognize you as a company. What is the program that we would like to put these people through? And you have to give a one, three, and six month program. And then at the end of it, you have to give them an opportunity to join your team. So what that looked like for me, and I stopped it because people, people don't understand entrepreneurship. And then when they get into it, they're like, wow, this is scary. And it's not, it, you just have to be consistent and you have to have the right community. Like, you know, I, my, my businesses are worth $5 million, but like, can I give you $5 million? No. Cause I take all the money that I have and I push it back in there and I make little money babies. Right. Cause when you put money with money, they come out and make little money babies. And you're like, Oh, I'll put you over here. You can make your own family, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> I don't keep money, man. Money's not meant for me to hold on to. It's meant to, to make more money. And most people don't get that. So when they go through the program, they don't understand. So one, three, five, or one, three, and six month programs. Um, then you get registered on Skillbridge and you can start telling people, hey, uh, this is available for you. And social media managing is great. Uh, there's a lot of people in India that are doing it. They Here's the price point for a social media manager that's worth um, anything. It's about two to $5,000 a month for them to manage your social media. And what you'll do is you'll take raw content like this and you'll send it to them and then they'll chop it up. And they'll do all the editing, put in the 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 extra, um, the extras like the the what is it called B roll stuff, and, mm-hmm. um, and and then send it out in the audience for you. Uh, but that's a lot of money. Unless you're advertising, you're not going to get it back. So um, I think it's good to know. And if I was in Skillbridge and I was looking at the opportunity to be a part of this uh, this thing that you guys got going on here, which is amazing. Um, I would definitely take you up on that just so I could learn more about social media, but it changes every day. And what you're going to get out of a skill bridge opportunity that if you guys offer it is um, a network of other people who are going through the same thing. And then that will blow you up whenever you're deciding you want to do something for the world. So Mm -hmm. it's definitely a worthy journey, but it's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. Social media is, is extremely time consuming. Yeah. And the fortune is in the follow up. Marketing itself is too. Yeah. The fortune's in the follow up. So social media has become the follow up to everything. Um, Mm -hmm. Back to LinkedIn, man. If you're starting a business, um, everyone says, you know, you got to have your your LLC or whatever in place. You can definitely do that. 
Um, it's that's easy. You can Google that, and that's easy. Um, but then people are saying, "Hey, you need a website." I, I don't think you need a website anymore. I think you can do it with LinkedIn, and uh, LinkedIn is phenomenal. LinkedIn actually, I my think first that, business didn't have a website for a year and a half. My recruiting agency, I yeah. did everything through LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn is amazing. So it's your professional network. It's basically business social media. And it's the one that I was a part of even when I was in the community that worked for me because I connected with other people who were on there. Um, and then I put everything like, here is my uh, business card. It's a QR code on a guitar pick. So whenever they scan this, they get all my socials. My first social that's out there is LinkedIn because I want them to see the professional side before I want them to see me hanging out with my dogs <laughs> or, or, or me going to the range again, like, or me hitting Shopping the gym. Elk. Yeah. <laughs> oh, TikTok's man. out at the bottom. Yeah. I mean, this year I didn't do any of that and I feel like I'm missing out. But anyways, it's what it is. Uh, but yeah, um, those type of things, branding, um, big deal. You can do all that through social media. You can sell through TikTok. Um, a lot faster now than you ever could, but people aren't really looking for us on TikTok. They're looking for mm -hmm. us on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is where I would start. Cool. Yeah. Well, I appreciate all, all the, I mean, we're gonna have to go through and, and spend a lot of time pulling all the nuggets back out of this one to, <laughs> to chop it up and, and uh, put the summary together. But uh, yeah, huge, huge. Thank you for, for being on the show. Uh, yeah, bro. Do you have any final things you want to put out like websites, books, events you're doing, uh, anything else you want to get some traction on? Yeah, man. The only thing I'm really work, working on right now is my TEDx talk. Um, and it's, if you put in Atlas TEDx, you'll see me standing on stage with the banner behind saying, uh, you know, be careful who you let in your life because they will change it. That's, that's where I'm at. That's my, that's my whole mantra right now. And, uh, you guys are a big part of that. Um, bringing you into uh, my community so that other people could see your content has definitely helped. And uh, I just want to commend you guys for doing that. So if you want to watch my TEDx talk, uh, that would be fantastic. It is flagged by Ted, uh, just like Jocko Willink's talk. So I'm not sure they're going to promote it at all. Uh, so if you're in the community and you're, and you're looking at my, my uh, video, that helps me out a lot uh, because people look at that as social credit on, on you as a speaker. Sure. And Average TED Talks in the first month get 411 views. I think I'm a little over 2K right now um, because the network is sharing it. So mm -hmm. uh, I appreciate that. So other than that, man, I don't need you to buy anything from me. Or, you know, I'm not going to push any products. If you want my book, it's 99 cents. I mean, I'm not trying to make money. I get like 20 bucks a month off of that book. Um, and I got another book coming, but... Uh, Beer fund. And yeah. There we go. Write your own book. Yep. Write your own book. Yeah. Like go to go to the website. Take my steps and write your own bestseller so that you can do more changes because our community is freaking amazing. And I can't believe we don't get to, you know, tout how cool we are. I mean, look at my, my belt buckle right there. <laughs> it says BLE. Are you going to show your shirt? Yeah, it's I a was Texas just looking at your belt shirt. buckle. <laughs> Hell yeah. I just wanted yeah, to show no. for, for people that are that aren't uh, watching it that are listening. It's that's a terrible idea. When do we start? I'm like, yeah, I feel like that's it's, everything I've done I mean, in my life, especially since leaving the yeah. military. Yeah, um, harder, yeah, we'll to, yeah, hundred percent. Um, and then we'll have to schedule a follow-up with you like eight months out. Expect you to have your podcast, at least your idea hashed out. If not, get your first <laughs> episode going. We'll hold you to it. That'll be your target. Eight months. We'll Sounds do a, good, a recap on, on what you've been able to accomplish in 16 months out of the military instead of just eight. Yeah, that's, that's going to be awesome, man. That's going to be epic. Well, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate you, Kevin. Cool. Greg, always good seeing you guys on social and, and even better seeing you in person, man. Likewise. Yeah, man, it was great getting you on here. Thanks, Atlas. All right, brother.